So we were talking about MacArthur and his uh, need to defend the Philippines. Uh, as I said, when the Japanese invade, uh, the Americans and Filipinos can't stop them. The Japanese end up reverting back basically more or less to the old war plan, Orange Plan, which is to try to hold on to Bataan. Um, let see what's it. Okay, here's the Bataan Peninsula. Okay, this is Manila Bay here. Here's Manila Bay. Okay, this down here is the island fortress of Corregidor, which is heavily armed with uh, massive guns to try to defend the harbor against invading ships. Okay, so most of the guns face out to sea. Okay? So this is the Bataan Peninsula. So the Americans and Filipinos fall into the Bataan Peninsula to try to hold out, uh, which is what the plan basically was. Wait, hold out, wait for reinforcements to arrive. Well, so you see here, this goes from January to April. Right? So this drags out for a while. So you can see for these successive lines, you know, the Americans are up here, but eventually their defenses crack, and they go down here. This drags on for a while. They don't have enough food. They don't have enough medicine. They don't have enough ammunition. Okay? And they're living in the jungles so they're catching tropical diseases, some of them. Okay? Since they don't have enough food, uh, they're on half rations, then they're on quarter rations, so they don't have enough caloric intake to maintain a good, healthy uh, bodies. And they, call, they start calling themselves the Battling Bastards of Bataan. Okay? I feel like everyone's forgotten them. Okay? Which they haven't. There's just not much the U.S. can do to get to them. Okay? Eventually, uh, in April, the defenses crack. The Japanese will seize the entire peninsula, thus leading, let me clean off these uh, squiggly lines here, to what we call the Bataan Death March. Okay? Now, I don't remember if this is in our textbook or not. Shockingly, I mean, just absolutely shocking that it's not in the textbook that we use over in Dallas. Okay? There's only so many pages, so they cut stuff out. But, I mean, it just boggles my imagination that they cut this out because it kind of ties in with things that are happening later. Uh, so you can see these, see these headlines here. Look at this. 36,000 U.S. men feared lost and fall of Bataan. Japs trap 36,800 as Bataan falls. Bataan collapses. Okay? Uh, the men are taken prisoner. Okay? Now, there's two factors here. Okay? One, under the Japanese warrior culture, uh, you're not supposed to surrender. You're considered kind of you know like low lives if you do. So they tend to look down on people who surrender as being inferior. The second, in all fairness to the Japanese, they probably didn't realize how bad a shape these men were in. Okay? Uh, the idea is to march them inland to near the city of Manila, where uh, there were prisoner camps had been being constructed. Okay. I don't know, it's 20, 25 miles. It's really for the kind of thing that, you know, well-fit, uh, you know, young physical army troops in good physical condition shouldn't have trouble making this march. But these men aren't in good condition. They've been on half rations and three quarter, I mean, quarter rations. Uh, they're underfed, they're malnourished, they have diseases and stuff. And so they, the Japanese march these men inland, and a lot of them do not survive the trip. Okay? That's why it's called the Batonic. Death March, D E A T H, death. Death is in dying. Okay? If you fall out along the way, you know, if you're lucky, some of your comrades might pick you up and get you in a stretcher. If you're unlucky, a Japanese guard might see you laying alongside the road, decide to just finish off with the bayonet. And a lot of these men do not make it to the prisoner of war camps. Now, can you keep this kind of thing secret? Well, no, because there's Filipinos, and they have radios. Some of them you know, can get out of the islands in boats. And word of the uh, death march does eventually you know, get, get to you know, the Americans. This is not going to endear the Japanese to the American public a whole lot. Remember, they've already attacked us at Pearl Harbor. And now they're mistreating uh, prisoners. Okay? So the Japanese brand name is very tainted. And one of the things this ties in with, and this I'm sure is in the book, was the idea of Japanese uh, internment during the war. 
they basically the government basically rounded up any you know Japanese citizens or Americans of Japanese descent uh, who were citizens off of the West Coast, rounded them up, and sent them inland to uh, for kind of minimum security prisons, okay? uh, internment camps. Okay? You're living in barracks. You're behind barbed wire. There's people with guns keeping an eye on you. Uh, and this happened before the, you know, uh, started, I think, before the Bataan Death March. But that's the kind of atmosphere that we're operating in. Okay? And, you know, Americans don't have warm, fuzzy feelings about the Japanese in the early months of 1942. So when you read about the Japanese reinternment in the textbook, you know, and I meant to put a picture in here of it, and I, I forgot. And I'm not going to redo the whole thing. Uh, but it'll, it'll talk about it in the textbook, I'm just, uh, which I'm sure it does. Okay, look for Executive Order 9066, I believe. Anyway, uh, so Baton Falls. Okay. Now, a few weeks later, that little island fortress of Corregidor I told you about, it, it held out. Okay. Uh, and there's troops on other islands in the Philippines as well. Now, MacArthur has left the Philippines. He's been ordered out by Franklin Roosevelt. And MacArthur's hesitant to go because he doesn't want to abandon his men, but the president has given him an order to get out, get to Australia, uh, to coordinate U.S. response to what's going on. And MacArthur figures, well, you know, I'm told by the president they need me, so he slips out of Krigador on a, on a patrol boat, is picked up by a submarine, and skirted off to Alaska where, to much to his irritation, he finds that there are no stockpiles of men and supplies awaiting him. Uh, you know, there will be eventually, but right now, if he's hoping to get back to the Philippines with reinforcements, they're not going to be anytime soon. So MacArthur, who's a, got an ego the size of Texas, and uh, is a bit of a showman, he you know, tells the press, he gets famous for this, after he comes from the Philippines to Australia, he says, I have come through and I shall return. And he intends to get back to the Philippines, back to his men. That's going to be his driving passion, uh, you know, for basically for the rest of the war. So anyway, when MacArthur leaves the Philippines, he turns over command to a guy named Wainwright. You don't need to know that. But Jonathan Wainwright, his you know, headquarters is on Krigador, that island fortress. With the Japanese in control of Bataan, they start shelling Krigador, and they will invade Krigador Island in, in April. Uh, the defenders of Krigador fight, uh, but they realize that you know, it's hopeless. Wainwright wants to surrender Krigador. Uh, he goes to talk to the Japanese, and they tell him, no, we want you to surrender all the U.S. forces in the Philippines. Now, he wanted to turn com control over the other islands to you know, the next guy in line and just surrender Krigador. Uh, but the Japanese are saying they won't stop the attack unless Wainwright surrenders the Philippines. So he's worried about the, the nurses in the hospital, about the wounded men, and he's under incredible, incredible duress. Uh, so he goes ahead and surrenders the entire Philippine island system to the Japanese, and MacArthur was furious with him for that. But he was operating, you know, under, like I said, a, a horrible conditions. Okay, So in April... Krigador Falls, and with it, the Philippines. Now, it's just been bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news since Pearl Harbor. And people are like, oh, I can't. Can somebody do something to hit back at the Japanese? And they come up with something. It's known as the Doolittle Raid. Okay? Now, militarily, this is inconsequential. But from a psychological, morale standpoint, it's a big deal. Okay? We wanted to try to find a way to strike back at Japan. Trouble is, we have no air bases within range of Japan. Right? Now, you could send aircraft carriers. Our aircraft carriers, fortunately, had not been in Pearl Harbor on the day of the attack. They were out running errands. Okay? Uh, and so you could send aircraft carriers to go over to Japan and uh, hit them with an airstrike. Now, here's the problem. Aircraft carriers carry small single-engine uh, airplanes. They have a limited range. If a Navy wants to hit Japan with its aircraft carrier aircraft, they'll have to get within about 200, 300 miles of Japan. Right. They would then have to launch the aircraft and then wait 
or would you aircraft to bomb Japan and then come back to the carriers? So that means it would be lingering off of the coast of Japan for a considerable length of time while the planes flew there, dropped their bombs, and flew back. Okay, so that's not a really very good solution. Then somebody comes up with a harebrained scheme. So it says, how about if we used two-engine army bombers? They have much longer range than the single-engine airplanes flown by the Navy. Okay? So the, uh, the plan is, hey, how about if we took off B-25 bombers from an aircraft carrier? Okay? We could launch from 400 miles out where the Japanese won't be expecting to find American ships. Okay? Uh, as soon as those planes launch, the carriers could turn and leave and head for Pearl Harbor. The army bombers could then bomb Japan fly on and land in friendly China, because China is our ally against Japan, right? Okay. There's only one problem with this scheme. Nobody has ever flown a two-engine army bomber off of an aircraft carrier. They're not designed for that. So they need somebody who's a really uh, ace, you know, aviator to do this. And so they end up with a guy named Jimmy Doolittle. Okay. Jimmy Doolittle. Kind of like Dr. Doolittle, the guy who talks to animals. This is Jimmy Doolittle. He's a very famous aviator from the interwar period. Okay? Uh, say, hey, he can probably pull this off. So Doolittle gets a, a bunch of volunteers from the Army. They all train to you know, launch these planes from you know, an aircraft carrier. The plan is that Doolittle will take off first okay? uh, near, you know, near the end of the day. Bomb, uh, you know, like Tokyo with bombs and set fires. And that the follow-up planes will arrive after dark using the fires to home in on. They would then drop their bombs, like I said, fly into China. They would land in China at an airfield and then uh, form the nucleus of a small air force operating in China. Okay. So this is not a suicide mission by any stretch of the imagination. But it does have a very thin margin of error. Okay. Now there's just one problem. Uh, they're supposed to launch from 400 miles out. About 800 miles out, they run into a Japanese picket boat uh, which spots the Americans. The Americans have to assume that the Japanese picket boat uh, has radioed a warning back to Japan. Okay. So at this point, there's really only two choices. You can abort the mission, turn around, sail back to Pearl Harbor, or you can take off from around 800 miles off, knowing you don't have enough fuel to get to the friendly bases in China. So what do you think they do? Well, they take off because they came all this way to bomb Tokyo, damn it. So they're not going to stop now. And so Doolittle takes off first off of the aircraft carrier USS Hornet. Okay. And there's the spelling of Doolittle up there. Okay. Up at the top. Doolittle. And his crews follow shortly thereafter. The 16 bombers bomb Japan. Okay. Each plane only has four bombs. So they inflict very minor damage, but militarily wise. But strategically, it's like, wow, somebody has finally done something to strike back at the Japanese. The planes all fly off towards China. They all run out of fuel. None of them make it to a friendly air base. They, uh, they all crash. Most of the men survive. Actually, 15 crashed. Uh, one went to Russia. Okay. Long story. I won't bore you with it. Uh, so the planes are all lost. Okay. The majority of the men survive. A few are captured by the Japanese. Some of them are put on trial for war crimes, for bombing Japan, and some of them are executed. Of course, the Japanese have been bombing China for you know, willy-nilly for years, but it's somehow different when people are dropping bombs on you. And so a few of Doolittle's men, two or three of them, are executed uh, for the crime of bombing civilians. Yeah. Once again, this is not going to make Americans feel warm, fuzzy thoughts about the Japanese people. Yeah. Uh, so militarily, this thing is just kind of a show. But, I mean, psychologically, it's like, yes, somebody has done something. You know, to strike back at the Japanese, and it will help lead uh, to something that will come in part three of this uh, lecture.